Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm going to get go ahead and give you a warning. I either talk really fast or I try to slow myself down, uh, but then I typically say a lot of us and um. So I apologize in for in advance for whichever I do. Um, I am excited about uh, being here today. I do enjoy talking about our remote pro and, and remote powering equipment. It's uh, to me, it's very interesting. It's fun to do. Um, I've been with Tycon Systems for just over seven years now as the sales and marketing manager. I spend most of my time is uh, working with customers and designing different systems, uh, educating other people on how to use our, our equipment. So that's what we're gonna do today. Hopefully it's informative for you and we will begin. So we'll start with our remote pro system. Our remote pro system is complete off-grid solution so that you have no AC power available uh, it could be in a parking lot, could be a mountaintop, could be out in the in a farm. So anywhere that you need power, but you don't have a way to uh, track power to you. We have many different types of systems or sizes. All of our systems are uh, designed specifically based on your application. So we have from a two and a half watt continuous power. And this is with everything is rated at six hours of peak sunlight. So everything is designed that way. Sorry, I thought I had muted everything, but apparently not. Um, with the, so this would be great for like an LED light that's running part time or um, uh, a sensor, uh, uh, like an irrigation pump part time. Then we have an eight watt. This would come with a 30 watt solar panel and a poly enclosure, enclosure like a plastic enclosure, holds up to 36 amp hours of battery. Um, this would again power like some LED lighting uh, through the night, irrigation pump, maybe that's running a little bit longer. Uh, that first two and a half watt will have, that's a 15 watt solar panel with a nine amp hour battery in our die cast enclosure. Then we have a slightly larger 85 watt solar panel, comes with a, an aluminum enclosure, will hold two batteries of a 52 amp hour um, at 20 watts continuous power. So this would be maybe you've got a, a hotspot, a wireless access point that you have somewhere, um, larger pump, or maybe you need just you have less sunlight in that area. Next, we have our 40 watt system. This would be two of our 85 watts, and this will hold two or four of our 52 amp hour batteries. This would get you an access point, a camera uh, for, that's at a low draw, maybe another sensor on there. And we have four of our 85 watt panels giving you 340 watts of solar array and a four or eight battery bank at, uh, let's see, would be 200 or 400 amp hours of battery in that uh, larger steel enclosure, giving you 80 watts continuous. So multiple cameras at the site. Then anything from uh, our 720 watt array on, we do include the pole. So everything else is uh, included with the remote pro system. We include the solar panel, enclosure, battery bank, solar controller, all the cables and mounting hardware. So you just need to add the pole that you're mounting it to. With our 720 watt array, these are two 360 watt panels. It's uh, too large to put on a large, uh, to put on a pole. So we provide the pole mount for it. So you can uh, get a little concrete pad, um, mount the system on the back, or we have an aluminum enclosure uh, for ground mounting. Uh, battery banks. So this would have from 400 amp hours to 720 amp hours of battery bank. And then we have a, a four panel system and we actually just introduced a six panel as well. So we have all the components for that. Now this is where we're getting into very high power PTZ cameras, um, maybe in low sunlight areas, because as you have less sunlight, you need more solar to charge those batteries. Um, and then that will help you get through the winter months. So again, everything designed based on your application. So we look at the total power draw of all of your devices. We look at the voltage requirements, and then we look at the peak sunlight in your specific area. And with that, we're able to calculate a complete system to keep your equipment up 24 hours a day with some extra autonomy and extra battery bank. So let's look at one of the calculations. So if you go to calculators.tyconsystems.com, you'll see this uh, as the top calculator. Again, we're looking at the total load in watts, so you can plug that in that first uh, window. Next is uh, hours of operation. How, how many hours in the day are you running? 
Typically, we leave it at 24 hours because that's what most people are doing. They'll run uh, access points and cameras throughout the day. But if you're running some LED lights, you just need them from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., you can change that to 12. If you're running a pump or a, you know, a pump would be maybe an hour a day. So go ahead and adjust that because that will drastically affect the size of the system if you don't need it for the full 24 hours. Next, we uh, look and put in the average hours of peak sunlight per day. So you can do that by hitting look up and it will it'll open a new window where you can put in the zip code or the city state. And then the last is the extra hours of battery backup needed. So you can put you can I usually leave it at zero when I first start to design a system just to see what I'm what the minimum requirement requirement would be. And then I can put in you know an extra 24 hours or 48 hours. Uh, we have pe had people say oh, I need five days of backup and not always realistic. Um, that would make you, you know, require a shed full of batteries to, to give yourself that requirement, especially when they're in sunny places like Southern California, Arizona. So it, it's it's physics, right? I mean, it's just an algorithm uh, formula that, that you plug in. So the more draw, the more solar and battery bank you need um, to keep that equipment going. So let's look at a typical application. We're going to look at a, a security solution. We do a lot uh, with security cameras. Uh, they're in parking lots or uh, we've had a lot uh, in um, manufacturing plants even in, in their parking lots or uh, monitoring gate uh, activity, monitoring the fence line or in farms, right? So typical application would be four cameras, let's say. I pulled up the uh, data sheet for this and it said uh, it's running on PoE or 12 volt DC. Now, most cameras, and I'm not going to say all, but most cameras, when they say PoE, it is 802.3 AF, which is the, a standard uh, by the IEEE. So each camera would be an 8 watts total power draw. And then they're going to put in one of our easy bridges. This is just a wireless point-to-point -point bridge at 2.4 gigahertz. And this has this is a 24-volt PoE, and uh, power consumption is at 4 watts. Now, to power everything, we're going to need a switch. So we're going to use our Versa switch. What this does, and I'll explain a little bit more on the Versa switch, but it gives you one port at 24 volts PoE to power that easy bridge, and then four at 802.3 AF. So from there, you can power all the cameras. So all five devices from that switch, but it does have a draw. It's three watts total power. So this gives us 39 watts that is pulling from that. And with the Versa switch, um, it does require a uh, 48 volt input. So we got to keep that in mind because we want to make sure that we're playing correctly with all of the uh, systems. So we're going to plug that number into our calculator and then we're going to hit the look up. And this is what pops up when you hit look up. And we're going to say that we're going to install in Atlanta, Georgia. When you look at this, it'll give you the average hours per month. And we're going to look at the lowest, assuming that you're running it year round. Now we have had applications where they say, you know, it's just for summer months, so April through September. So then pick the lowest month from that group. Um, and again, that, that will make a drastic difference in sizing your system. We want to be as accurate as possible. We don't want to, to send somebody a system and then, oh, it wasn't big enough because we added some extra cameras or we changed cameras. So we're always wanting to help and make sure that we're getting the uh, exact information from you so that we can make an appropriate suggestion. So now we can plug those uh, uh, numbers into our calculator. We're going to do 39 watts total power draw, 3.79 hours of peak sunlight, and we're going to give an extra 24 hours of uh, extra battery bank just for some extra autonomy. So this would be a 282 watt solar array, a minimum size needed. Now, I don't know of anybody that makes a 282 watt solar panel, and it's always good to have a bit of a buffer. So uh, we're going to look at to what system it's going to uh, suggest. And then we need at least 312 amp hours of battery bank to give us that extra 24 hours of autonomy. So this gives us several options. We're looking at the RPSTL um, series at 12, 24, or 48 volt output. This would be a 400 amp hour battery bank and a 340 watt solar array, which all falls under the parameters of what we suggest. And this is what your system would look like. It would be four of our 85 watt panels. Now I'm going to give you a breakdown of what that actually means. So RP is just our part number for Remote Pro. The next group of uh, letters would be the type of enclosure. So again, our die-cast poly enclosure 
we have a small and a large aluminum enclosure. Then we have a large steel enclosure. So the small aluminum would hold 100 amp hours, and that'll be two of our 52 amp hour batteries. Our large aluminum would hold four of our 52 amp hour batteries. The steel, large steel enclosure will hold up to eight of our 52 amp hour batteries, and that has a 1U rack mount in there as well. And all of our aluminum and steel has extra room for the uh, solar controller, uh, the switch, uh, maybe any other uh, small equipment that you need to put in there. And then we have our aluminum ground mount enclosure. This will hold uh, over 720 amp hours of battery bank plus extra storage space. The next group of numbers is the battery voltage. So this would be a 12 volt or 24 volt or 48. And then we have the 12 slash 24. So it can be the solar controller will could you give you 12 volt output or for 24 volt. The next would be a 24 volt or 48. Um, and then the 1248, just to consolidate numbers, would be 12, 24, or 48. And we also have some unique uh, solar controllers that have a 24 or 48 volt PoE output. This would be for smaller applications, maybe a couple of devices, um, but that is a, just a versatile controller that allows you to, to power directly from the controller. So you can avoid using a switch. The next group of numbers is our battery capacity. So nine amp hours are smallest, up to 1400 amp hours of battery bank and then the last group is the solar panel array so from 15 watts up to 2100 watts of solar so that's a breakdown of our part number so when you see that part we try to make it intuitive so it's very easy to, to know what you're getting with that system so with this particular example i would recommend the rpstl 48m or it would be i guess the 1248m and what the m stands for is mppt so that's just to differentiate between the, the controllers. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on the controllers in a minute. Uh, the reason I would choose that 48 volt is so that can power the switch directly because that does need a 48 volt input. So now you don't need any converters, any voltage regulators. Colt controller uh, has a load output, will power the switch, and now your switch is gonna power all those devices for you. Uh, along with our remote pro system, we saw a, a need for a few years ago. Um, I attend a lot of security trade shows and we are leading the industry in fixed solar. We had a lot of people that uh, needed the mobile solar. So maybe you have a construction site, you need power for six months at that site uh, to whether you're putting up security cameras or just charging some batteries for your power equipment. Um, and so with this, we designed the remote pro solar trailer. And what this does is uh, 720 amp hours of battery bank and solar array. You can drop it off at the site, you park it where you need, the solar panels will swivel south facing, uh, is always how we want our solar uh, panels facing. Comes with an 18 foot pneumatic mast. There's no outside wiring. So there's a, a pump that's included and everything is pre-wired in that aluminum enclosure and takes about a minute for the, you mount all the equipment at the, the mast, takes a minute for the pump to send the uh, pneumatic mast up to the very top, has locking pins, so there's no way for anybody to uh, to do any vandalism and, and drop the mast to try to steal your equipment. Um, the lock, the uh, aluminum enclosures have locks as well uh, to prevent theft. Um, and then so, but like I said, everything is pre-wired so that you don't have to uh, do anything. We, we ship it directly to you, ready to go. So difference between PWM and MPPT. Uh, PWM stands for power width modulation and MPPT stands for maximum power point tracking. Now we, we have a couple of PWM controllers. These are, like I said, for smaller applications. The first, the SC2420 is a 12 or 24 volt DC output. Uh, so this is what, this is the brains of our remote pro system. These are, have the battery output or and the, uh, solar input and then the load output so you connect everything through this and this charges your batteries through the solar panel so that it's protecting all of the equipment um, this is a 20 amp controller and then our next is the scpoe and it's there's the 1224 1248 2424 2448 and that's a dc is the first two part numbers so it's a 12 or 24 volt dc that's the uh, output load on the back of the controller. And then there's a 24 or 48 volt PoE output on the front. And then it also has a data input. And again, this does all the brain work. 
Now, the main difference between PWN, PWM, and MPPT is MPPT does a better job with lower sunlight. That's basically, I mean, there's there's obviously more features with the MPPT. You see it has the LCD screen. It's a it's a touch screen, so you can set your uh, your controls through that. Um, you can select, these also will work with all types of batteries, including lithium batteries. Um, and But when you have lower sunlight, you want more current coming from the panels. Well, the PWMs can't handle that extra current, so with the MPPTs that can. So even if you have, you know, 48 volts, 60 volts coming from the solar panels, you can still get a 24 volt output from the uh, solar controllers. So just a way to charge your batteries faster when you have low sunlight. So they're great for larger applications. Our last controller is our TP-DIN SC4820. Now this is a 20 amp MPPT controller. It does require a 48 volt, sorry, 48 volt solar input. Um, also has a seven port PoE switch built into it. And you can manage each port and configure to 24 volt or 48 volt PoE out. It also has our TP-DIN monitor firmware built into it. So you can remotely monitor and control your equipment without having to be at the site. So you can reboot your equipment, you can look at your battery voltage, your current, your temperature, set up logistics. I'll talk about the, the web monitor in a bit. So let's look at the UPS Pro. The UPS Pro is you have AC power, but you maybe have some blackouts for a significant period of time. Maybe you have brownouts. Maybe you have a pole uh, a light pole in a parking lot and you have power from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. but nothing from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. so you need something during the day you could use our remote our UPS Pro system so you wouldn't need solar the power at night would charge the batteries and then as soon as power cut off your equipment would run off uh, uh, those batteries so you could still put up those uh, uh, security cameras and stuff like that so we many different options you utilizing the same battery bank same enclosures so from our 9 amp hour to 36 amp hour, and then that aluminum, we have the 50 to 100 amp hour. And then we have our 200 to 40, 400 amp hours. So let's look at the calculation. Uh, it's a bit simpler. We don't need to know the location because we just know that you already have power. But we're going to use that same application. We have 39 watts of total power draw, but we want 24 hours of backup power. And that's, you know, in case it's a remote area and we just need time to get out there, to be able to connect to a generator or um, you know find another solution so all you do is put plug in those numbers hit calculate and we need at least 156 amp hours of battery bank to keep 39 watts continuously powered and so now we have our suggested systems we have the ups so U ups would be the ups pro small enclo aluminum enclosure um, has 12 or 24 volt output at 200 amp hours of battery bank or we have a larger steel enclosure that uh, again 12 24 or 48 volt output and this will handle up to 600 watts uh, with that battery charger and that's what your system would look like so ups pro fairly simple now <clears throat> excuse me let's say that you're in an area with low sunlight in winter months but maybe you're in the midwest you have good wind steady winds uh, you can add the breeze pro to any 12 or 24 volt remote pro application or system um, this will help supplement and charge your batteries when you don't have that sunlight when the sun goes down but the wind is still blowing this will help charge up uh, your batteries um, it has a built-in controller so and so you tie this directly onto the batteries not through the solar controller and this will help charge um, when sun's down it has with that controller it also reads the battery uh, levels so it will uh, prevent it from overcharging your batteries and it'll send the energy through the tail um, it has a braking system so it'll prevent from overspinning and damaging the the turbine so has a very low startup speed about four and a half miles an hour obviously the the quicker the wind the more power it will charge and it's uh, rated up to 400 watts so great for some applications not for all uh, but if you do have uh, an environment maybe that's uh, you like I said low sun good wind can be added to those systems our TP did monitor web 3 uh, we designed this many years ago uh, obviously we're on version 3 now the the need came from 
most of our applications are in remote areas and customers wanted a way to be able to read their equipment without having to drive on site. And, and you know, we have customers that have uh, winter sites that you can only get there through a helicopter or snowmobile. So we wanted a way to read the batteries, read the equipment, what's going on, reboot. Um, and so we designed the TPDN Monitor Web 3. So this has uh, four voltmeters, four current sensors, and two temperature sensors, four relays, two which are normally open, two normally closed, and then you have all of the relay controls that you need and email alerts. So let's say you, you set up the, uh, the parameters. Let's say send me an alert when voltage drops below 11.8 volts. You get an email alert. Um, temperature you know, spikes, you get an email alert, and you get to set those parameters. So you get to be in total control. You own the device, you own the software on that, and, so you, and you can also uh, customize the software um, for you, and then you can access it via web or SNMP. Now, it doesn't have an, uh, a built-in Bluetooth or um, cellular or wireless or anything like that, so you would need to have some sort of way to communicate to the site through it, but then you can just connect this directly to that. Um, if you're running low on sunlight, it has the onboard data logger and history graph, so you can pull up and see how much voltage you're drawing throughout the day. So just a great tool to have in most uh, or in any remote application. Uh, many, even in non-remote applications, just if maybe you have to have a satellite office uh, and you want to be able to log in and see what's going on over there um, with, you know, temperature, like, like I said, it has, a, it has an external temperature probe. So we had a customer that set it up in his cabin and when temperature dropped below 32 degrees, he'd get an alert so that he can make sure because it told him that his heat is out and then he wanted to avoid his pipes freezing. So just a lot of different applications for these. So let's go over a couple uh, customer application photos. So <clears throat> again, I mean, it looks like they have power, but they needed a way to, uh, to keep it up um, if power went out. Uh, small solar application, so this would be powering like a, a sensor at this site, but they needed the sensor um, up 24 hours a day, no matter what. So uh, we did a uh, one of our solar trailers for a festival, and they needed a way to uh, have all of their uh, their employees or their their tents be able to do it, run POS uh, and run sales through that. And so that was able to power that for them. A lot of uh, out, you know, out in the middle of nowhere mountaintop applications where customers needed the power. Uh, I talked to a gentleman once who told me this was a couple years ago, so I'm sure it's gone up, but he got a quote from uh, his local electrical company and it was of $150,000 to take uh, cable run power up to the top of his mountain. So, you know, there and I, I have heard uh, much more expensive since then. This uh, bottom right is a LED light that they wanted to light up their city sign in Ohio at night. This is just a, you know, there's a parking lot and then their office building. So they could have trenched through the parking lot, but for a very simple solution, they decided to go with the remote pro system and power those LED lights uh, to light up the sign. Again, just very remote areas, construction sites. Um, and then this is one of my favorites, this uh, top left. It, they have an osprey nest in the middle of a lake and wanted to watch the uh, nesting patterns migration of the osprey. So they have this nest in the middle of the lake, but then and they needed a camera. So they put up one of our remote pro systems to to power the camera and uh, and be able to monitor. So just a very cool, unique um, application. Next, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on Tycon Power. So Tyco, and the reason we do this is because we're powering many different manufacturers. Right? You tell us what cameras. We're not going to tell you. You you get to pick the cameras that you want. You you pick the access points that you want. Each manufacturer though may have different voltage requirements. Uh, with that, they, you might be 12 volt DC, 24 volt PoE, 48 volt PoE, 56 volt PoE. So there's so many different types of ways to power that we have our Tycon power line um, where we can take in 9 to 72 volts convert to 24, 48, 56 volts. We have passive or 802.3 AF, AT, or BT compliant. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that in a minute. We have 10100 or gigabit and now 10 gigabit. 
All of our devices have built-in uh, surge protection and they are industrial temperature strength. So they run in, in extreme temperature ranges. So let's look at the POE standard. So this might be you know, easy, uh, old for you, you know, not new. This might be new for some. So many years ago, uh, they, they wanted a standard for POE. I say they, IEEE wanted a standard, right? Um, and so they said, we want to make sure that we're protecting the equipment. So all the switches that were created were 48 volt, uh, but they wanted to make sure that you're not plugging something into the line that isn't 48 volts. So they created the standard of 802.3AF. And what that does is it creates a handshake between the device and the power. So the power will say, hey, are you good to receive me? The device will say, yep, send it, and it'll send the power. If you plug it in, it says, are you going to receive me? And it doesn't respond, then it won't send power. So it's just a way to protect your equipment. And with that, many companies to save money started creating just passive. So there's a 24 volt passive. There, that means there's no standard, right? So what you're sending out is what you're going to get. So easy way to blow up a radio is to plug into a non-passive or into a passive device. Well, with these standards, we have the 802.3AF which uh, by standard gives you up to 15.4 watts of power. Then manufacturers said, you know what, we need more. Cameras are now PTZ. We want to do, uh, we want to power these uh, access points because there's more features. So I uh, 802.3AT or PoE plus released and now has a 30 watt, up to 30 watt device. Then company said, that's not enough. We want even more power, bigger PTZs, more power for the radios. So in 2018, they released the 802.3 BT standard, which it, which requires four pair, because each uh, ethernet cable would have, that's taking data, so power over ethernet, would be eight wires, four pairs. So this requires power going on all four, but will give you up to 90 watts of power. So when you see PoE++, that's typically 60 watts of power. The UPoE was um, designed from, I believe that's a Cisco uh, proprietary um, standard. And then there's four PPoE, which is another um, non-ratified vendor specific item. So we do have 802.3 BT devices, both uh, types three and four. Um, you can see the differences there, whether it's up to 60 watts, up to 90 watts. Um, some manufacturers get cute and they do, most devices are mode B and they say, now we're going to do mode A, which just means it's a different pinout. So because of the different manufacturers and a lot of them don't want to play together, we designed our Tycon PoE and power devices so that you can um, have all the manufacturers play nicely, either from a switch or a DC converter or PoE injector. So hopefully this makes sense to you. Um, if you would like this, this is something that uh, we put together, you know, send send me an email and then I'll send that out to you just because it's, it's a good to have that standard knowing what you're getting. So with that, we designed DC converters. So this is going to be a DC input and a DC output. So we range from 9 to 72 volts and then same 24, 48, 56 out. Uh, DC is typically going to be like a wire terminal or you could have a PoE input. Those are all considered DC. So same, same ranges that we discussed earlier. Here's a couple of our most popular DC converters. The 1224, this will take in nine to 36 volts in and give you 24 volt PoE out at 19 watts. And it is gigabit. We do have a non gigabit version as well. Uh, so that's, you know, again, we try to make the part numbers intuitive. So 12 volt in as the average 24 volt PoE out, G is for gigabit, D is for compliant. Um, so 802.3 AF, AT or BT is compliant. If it doesn't have it, then it's passive. Um, next is the 2448 gigabit compliant high power. This is what it looks like, a little bit longer footprint uh, because of the extra power that's in there. And again, same, uh, you know, 18 to 36 volts in, 56 volt out at 802.3 AT and 35 watts. Then we have PoE converters. Now we have a lot of those Cisco switches, a lot of those um, expensive switches are 48 volt standard. And 
you can only power devices that require 48 volts. Well, we designed a little slim inline PoE converter that'll take that 42, 48 volts and down convert to 24 volts. Can you, so you can power that to access point that can only handle 24 volts. We also have a PoE converter where it'll take in the 24 volt PoE and convert to 56 volt PoE. And we have, so the DC XX is just is, we have several different part numbers under the same category, whether it's 1256, 2456, or 48 volt, or 4856, and that just signifies the voltage input. All are at 56 volt out gigabit and VHP. We also, I, I should have done the G and then in parentheses a D because we do have the 802.3 AT compliant output. VHP is very high power, so this is up to 70 watts. So this is going to power most access points, most cameras. There are some now that are requiring more, but um, when we released that, that was plenty sufficient. We do have a, I, I haven't created a part number yet, but uh, we will have a extremely very high power. Maybe we'll call it that, I don't know. Uh, again, BT standard, because that is a, a, a new requirement. So we do have the same 12, 24 or 48 volt input 56 output at the BT standard. So four pairs of uh, power going out to the device. Now we have our PoE injectors. Now PoE is a power over ethernet. So you're taking data and power on one single Cat5 line or Cat6 line, and but it has an AC power cord. So this would be AC input with 24, 48, 56 volt out. Again, passive or compliant and standard 10 100 gigabit or 10 gigabit so let's look at a couple devices so this would just be a simple poe injector 20 at 24 volt 19 watts or we have a 48 volt gigabit um, passive and compliant at 24 watts we also have a eu version available so if you're uh, in the eu or um, are sending it out there, we, we can swap out the power cords for you. These are our 10 gigabit PoE injectors. So the PoE Plus, uh, pop quiz, how many watts is the PoE Plus? How many is the PoE Plus Plus? Uh, hopefully you answered 30 watts and 60 watts. And if you did, pat yourself on the back. Uh, we have a PoE 24 volt at 10 gigabit. That'll be 24 watts. And then we have a lot of splitters. Maybe they, you have a PoE injector, or sorry, PoE uh, Cat5 cable. So you've got 48 volts coming out of that, but you need to split the power and data. So that's what this device does. Um, you'll have 12 volts coming out of that barrel connector, or we have a 24 volt AC option, or a five volt DC option as a USB, and then we take the data out. So if you're powering like a camera that can only accept that 12 volt or a 24 volt AC, uh, other splitters, 48 volt in, 24 out. Uh, in this one, we'll actually, it'll get, it'll accept 802.3 AT, but then give you 24 volt DC on that wire terminal and still keep the uh, uh, 48 volt output uh, on that PoE. Another unique PoE injector, this is a, a basically, I mean, a mini switch, right? So you've got a AC input, but you have two output at 56 volts. Then we have a lot of unique PoE switches. So if you've got uh, anything that requires three to uh, 10 ports, um, or I should say eight ports of PoE, but also has SFP. So again, same standards, same passive, we do have managed and unmanaged switches, and then they do have fiber. So let's look at our three port switch. This is, it's a switch, but it's also a PoE extender. So you have a one input at 802.3 AT, so 48 volt. Well, then you can have two output of 802.3 AT and then run another 100 meters. So great for, you know, you have a long cable run, the max you can run uh, cable for uh, over PoE is uh, 100 meters or 330 feet then you need something. So this you can do without having an external power supply. You can just plug in and now have two outputs. 
it, it is not outdoor rated, so you would need some sort of a, we do have a switch enclosure that you could put it in to protect from the environment. And we have a lot of five port unmanaged switches, uh, very unique, very popular. So our Versa I talked about earlier has three ports at 802.3 AT, one at 24 volt, and then a PO, high PoE or PoE++ at 60 watts. We have a multi-switch, so it'll accept multiple volt inputs, and then you can have multiple volt, multiple volt output. Our most popular is the Dash 24. So this will take 10 to 36 volts, but convert everything to 802.3 AT. And then we have a, a compliant switch, an NC or non-compliant or passive switch. And then we have a compliant at BT input. So a lot of switch options, all available um, for shipping right away. Next are managed switches. So these are fully manageable at gigabit. You do need, do need 48 volt input um, for these switches. We have a four port and eight port option along, both come with two SFP ports, um, industrial temperature strength. Um, I think I said, but all of them are 802.3 AT out. So if you do have like a device and you have one of these, you could just use, the, you have a device that's 24 volt, you can just throw in one of our uh, PoE converters to down convert. Or now we released our, oh, I didn't fix my pictures, I apologize. So we have uh, the SWG AT slash 24. So I was doing a little picture swap and then I lost track of time, so I apologize. But what this does is allows you to configure each port to 24 volt or 48 volt on any of those ports. Still has the two fiber, fully manageable, um, 30 watts per port, but now you can have them play between, you know, you can have multiple 24 volt devices, multiple 48 volt devices. And then next is our SW8G AT slash BT slash 24 and then dash SFP. Again, I apologize uh, for cutting that part number off, um, but this will give you two ports at 802.3 AT or 24 volt, two ports at 802.3 BT, so 90 watts on each port, and then four ports at 802.3 AT. So very versatile, lets you use you know, with multiple devices uh, with uh, different voltage requirements. Okay, then we have a, a legion of power accessories that we offer. Uh, we do have surge protection, so just a standard inline at 24 volt or 48 volt. We have a rack mounted version of this as well. So 24 port rack mounted uh, surge protector. We have another PoE extender and this is outdoor rated. It is IP66, so you can run 100 meters, connect to this uh, in one put, you got your input, then you've got your out, run another 100 meters. And you can actually daisy chain a few of these together to give yourself 400, 500 uh, meters of Cat5 cable run without having an external power supply. Some unique PoE converters. Um, let's say that you have a switch that you uh, don't wanna get rid of, but you need more power. So you can use one of these PoE converters. You, you will need two ports from that switch. It combines the 802.3 AF and now gives you 802.3 AT at 30 watts. Or you can take, maybe you have 802.3 AT ports at 30 watts each. You can combine into this device, um, this other part number, and now give you 60 watts power on four pair. So just a, something, an inexpensive, option so you don't have to replace your whole switch to power something that you've added to it. Uh, we have many different voltage regulators, so that's why I couldn't name them all, but uh, basically any DC input output you need, we make it. Uh, we also have a high power version, so it's built more like the, uh, the DC converters, but again, it's just wire terminal to wire terminal, and again, 12, 24, 48 volts, 56 volt out. So when you have a device that is very picky on the voltage it receives and it can't waver, these are great devices for that. So that is the end of my presentation. Hopefully everybody's still awake. Um, I'll turn it back over to Angela if there's any questions on uh, anything I went over. Thanks, Seth. Yes, there are some questions. Um, this question kind of came in way early in your presentation, but they're asking, how does the plastic closure stand up to desert sunlight? Um, so it does have 
like typically we encourage you to use your solar panels to shade the enclosures with our poly enclosure it doesn't come with a uh, thermostatically controlled fan all of our aluminum and steel enclosures do so there is worry however we do have these all over the country all over the world we have these in arizona as well as the deserts of nevada and they hold up nicely when shaded properly if it's just going to stand out there i mean it is going to get pretty hot in there so at that point i would probably encourage you to use an aluminum enclosure that will be able to reflect the sunlight but also has the fan inside to help keep it cool great thanks uh, the next question I have is, what is POE++? POE++, I, I, uh, hopefully we could go back to that. But so POE++ is basically a, a non-ratified standard. It's what some people term, it's basically 60 watts of power. So there's no standard to it, but it's usually associated with 802.3 BT because it is above the AT standard of 30 watts. So. Okay, great. I have a next question here. Uh, this customer says, we use a mix of devices. It has been challenging. What is your recommended design strategy for mixed POE systems? Oh, great question. So what we try to do is pick the majority. It's, it's better to convert um, less devices. So if you have, let's say we have 10 devices, two are 24 volt, um, six are 48 volt, and two or something else, I don't know. Pick the one that you have the most of. It's better to have everything. If the majority are at 48 volt, wire your system at 48 volt, and then you can down convert those other two. Now we do have several different switches that will allow you to play with that. So that's the a, a great you know option with those switches and they are in stock. We have them ready to ship immediately with our managed switches. Um, we have the POE converters, but anything you add does have draw. You know, DC converter, has draw. Usually it's very low. I think ours are less than a watt. But if that matters, you know, in your scenario because you're that tight, then everything, you know, you add to it is adding extra draw. So the goal is to find the the majority of your voltages uh, th that are similar and wired at that. If the majority at 24 volt, wire at 24 volt and then convert up to 48 for that one or two devices that you need. Great, thank you. Uh, next question here, TP-SW5G, are those uh, cases poly or metal? They are plastic, so they're, they're poly type. Right. Uh, next question here, do you work with Cambium equipment? Absolutely. So we do a lot of system designs with Cambium. They put on their spec sheet 30 uh, volts, but I do know that uh, just working with Cambium uh, a lot, they their equipment will accept 24 volt and so that's that's more of a it's not a standard but it's more common we don't i don't see too many 30 volt uh poe injectors except from cambium but yeah we power cambium all the time with our poe injectors and dc converters and switches at 24 volts awesome next question here how do you keep the batteries warm so that in sub-zero temperatures the batteries stay at an operating temperature so there's a couple of things that you can do um, one is the equipment inside is usually enough to keep it warm, right? So you've got a controller, you've got a switch, you've got all of that emit, emits heat, and that's usually enough. If it's not, and with the, the web monitor, you can see how cold it's getting. We have had customers in Canada and northern U.S. where it gets extreme, negative 40, that will bury the battery bank. So they'll, bury, they'll put it in the enclosure, bury it, you know, a couple feet underground because it does keep warmer than in the, and then in the air or you could line the enclosure um, with uh, uh, you know, cold resistant um, padding so it helps keep that temperature warm. Typically, we don't worry too much about the cold. It's the heat that is more affected just because you know, there's nothing inside the enclosure that will keep it cool except for our fan. So that's our main it, it, issue that we see is just the extreme heat but there are those extreme environments so burying the batteries or um or maybe a lining with some insulation uh, will help keep it warm great uh next question here for your calculator can you select co countries outside of the usa yeah that's a great question i apologize i didn't cover that so if you when you hit look up 
uh, opens up that new window, right? And then above, there's a note that says, and I should have said that, and I apologize, I'm kicking myself. So there's a the that's only for the U.S. So it says, hey, if this is outside the country, click this, and it's a it'll take you to a site that is uh, international. You type in the city and the country, and then you're able to pull it up, and um, you set the tilt angle. And the tilt is another calculator that we have on our website where you put in the latitude and it'll tell you how steep um, the solar panels should be. Again, anything north of the equator should all be south facing. Anything south of the equator should be north facing. Um, but And then you have it at the optimum winter angle so that you can get the maximum uh, powering uh, in winter months. And then you select, uh, then when you continue, you'll have a whole database of the hours of peak sunlight in that country. So yes, we, we can absolutely um, look at the peak sunlight all over the world. Great, uh, here we have, in the cabinet solutions where the part number has two battery voltages indicated, it means that the system has the output of two voltages at the same time? No, it means that you pick one, right? So you would wire the batteries, they're capable, and we include all of the cablings, so that you can wire them at 12 volt or 24 volt. So you don't get a dual output from that. Um, and, and the reason you'd want to select is maybe, you know, you could wire them in parallel, keep them everything at 12 volt if you need a 12 volt system, or you could wire two batteries in series, get 24 volt if that's what's needed for the output, or you take four batteries, wire them in series and get 48 volt. So that just means that they're 12 or 24. Got it. All right, next question here. In tropical salt air environment, do you recommend plastic or aluminum enclosures? Um, plastic are good for that. Our largest plastic is only a, a, you know, a 14 by 10 by five, so it's not gonna be super large. That's why we released the aluminums last year, and that holds up better with uh, salt environment. We do powder coat as well to help protect it. Um, I would also suggest you know checking on them periodically. Uh, spraying them with uh, rust-oleum or something to to help prevent rusting, but you know this, the aluminums do a really good job of uh, in those salty, harsh environments. Great. Uh, do you have solutions with lithium batteries? Not at the moment, but we are in the process of testing. So we've been looking at this for years. Uh, shipping lithium batteries has been a logistical nightmare. Um, people, everybody needs to be. Uh, certified to be able to handle batteries even if you're not handling the batteries if you're handling the paperwork you need to be certified now regulations are a bit changing and people are getting more comfortable our mppt controllers will work with the lithium batteries they'll power them just fine we just don't offer that solution yet but as i mentioned we are in the uh, testing stages i believe that we're probably a few months away before if, if everything goes well to releasing uh, systems with lithium batteries Obviously, there's pros and cons to using lithium over our lead acid um, AGM batteries. Some of those pros is the lithiums are lighter, um, smaller, last a lot longer. Con is they're a lot more expensive and they're tougher to ship. Um, if you by chance have a local source, let's say you're in Florida and you've already got you know your battery, your lithium battery guy uh, down the road, we can do a customized no battery solution. So it's still a remote pro system. We just will take out the batteries and, and customize that so then we can ship that system and then you'd be able to add your own batteries to it. Okay, great. Um, this, this next question, this customer is based in Florida and it's also about um, batteries. So they're asking, can the battery be placed away from the solar? So they're based in Florida and they would like to be able to put the batteries in a cooler location. Yes, you, you can do that. Obviously, there's going to be loss um, anytime you have long cable runs. Um, but you can, you know, we provide the solar cables, we provide the battery cables. Um, the battery cables aren't very long because typically you want everything close. So what you would do is have everything installed in one location. And I think our largest or our longest solar cable is 60 feet. Um, if you need something longer, then you're you're welcome to build your own cable and put as far as your ways you want. But I will caution you that distance does equal loss. So you will lose some current um, from the solar panels to your uh, battery bank. 
Great. Um, that was kind of the last question. I know several of you asked if you can get a copy of the presentation. The webinar has been recorded, so everybody will get a copy of the recorded webinar. Um, if you want, we can send you the presentation to your email. Um, if Seth, you want to send me a copy of that, then we can send that directly to you. But other than that, the replay will also be sent to everybody and be posted on our YouTube channel as well as Streakwave's uh, Tycon Systems webpage. So um, that helps answer that. And I don't see any other questions. Seth, you did a great job. I just want to thank you for doing the presentation and everybody that attended. Uh, if there's any last minute things that you wanted to just include, Seth, uh, please go ahead. I appreciate the time, Angela, and I, I don't want to bore anybody else any longer. But I do want to just say that, you know, our goal is to help you. So if you go to tyconsystems.com, we have a contact us page. So you're welcome to reach out directly if you have some questions. We assist everybody with uh, free system designs. Um, we have a team that are ready to help and or jump grab your uh, streakwave rep give us a call we're happy to jump on a call and help kind of walk you through it um, and this streakwave can provide all the pricing for you but you know our goal is to help educate and uh, do unique system design so reach out to us if you have questions on tycon power on what kind of switches will work with your equipment please please call or email we're happy to help great thank you have a great day thanks you too thanks guys